This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 769, recorded on June 15th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here, it's a nice sunny day. It's actually Springfield puffy clouds, and it's 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 24 Celsius. So it's just really perfect. Here it is 26 Celsius and partly cloudy. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, great to be here. It sounds like I have a combo of what Kathy and Vincent have because I have <laughs> the blue skies and the bright fluffy clouds and all of that, um, but 79 Fahrenheit, 26 Celsius. And uh, Rich is away for a few weeks uh, traveling across the country. Um, and that's usually it on Tuesdays, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Kathy, tell us about your ASV PSAs. Okay. Public service announcements. Just wanting to remind people, uh, if you're already vaccinated and you're venturing out into groups of people who might not be and uh, may have questions, they can still go to ASV town halls, asv.org slash education which is pretty easy, but you can also just Google ASV town halls and you'll uh, get to the right place. And we have at least one more that's scheduled in Spanish coming up on June 22nd. So uh, if you know people that really would be more comfortable in Spanish at a town hall, encourage that. And then the second thing is about the ASV meeting that's coming up in July. And we sent this in our email to members, but wanted to uh, remind them of it in case they didn't read their email in detail. Who would that be? I don't know. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, for the social events in the evenings, uh, we have the capability with this platform of having sort of the equivalent of Zoom breakout rooms. And so uh, we want to encourage people, if you want to have a themed breakout room, to send us your idea of a theme and then we can get it all organized and, and publicize it. And so, for example, there's two themed rooms that the plant virologists are planning. Uh, another kind of theme room is some lab alumni from a couple of labs are going to have a room together. And another one is planned for teachers of undergraduate virology. One of the four nights when there's a social, uh, social hour. So, um, be thinking about that because we know that everybody's missing seeing everybody in person, but at least you have the chance to maybe get together and discuss some science or some non-science um, at these social events. Oh, thank you. Yesterday, Novavax issued a press release about their vaccine phase three trial, which is called PREVENT-19. And that stands for the Prefusion Protein Subunit Vaccine Efficacy Novavax Trial COVID-19. I'm trying to emphasize the bold <laughs> that make up prevent. <laughs> A two-to-one randomized placebo-controlled observer-blinded study. 29,960 participants, 18 years of age and older in 119 locations in the U.S. and Mexico. And this is uh, being done with financial support uh, from many U.S. government agencies, including BARDA, which is providing up to $1.75 billion. Wow. Anyway, uh, the numbers, I'm sure you're interested in this, um, Overall efficacy, 90.4%. 77 cases were observed. And that's out of the 29,000. 63 in the placebo and 14 in the vaccine group. So that's where the 90.4% comes from. All cases in the vaccine group were mild. 10 moderate and 4 severe cases were observed in the placebo group. Uh, which gives an efficacy of 100% against moderate or severe disease. 
And um, maybe I, we should jump in and remind people what the nature of this vaccine is. We talked mm -hmm. about it with Matt Freeman. It's the florette of spikes. So it's just a protein vaccine and it's adjuvanted with some uh, saponin derivative. So this is a different technology than any of the other um, COVID-19 vaccines, but this is a technology that's sort of similar to some of the other vaccines that people may have received. They say in the press release, it is a purified protein that can neither replicate nor cause COVID-19. And I should also add, it will not integrate into your genome and it will not become a prion right. and cause your prions to misfold. Man, I hear that all the time. Oh, no. Really? I hadn't heard that one yet. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> we had a discussion one night. Someone got on and said, I'm an expert in prion diseases. Let me tell you all about this. And as soon as somebody says that, then you know that they're, they're fake. Anyway. Um, what else should we talk about? The, there was, they, they had obviously some variants uh, involved in these infections. Um, let's see. They say 100 sequence data available for 54 of the 77 cases. So we know uh, in those cases which variant is involved. And they say 100% um, efficacy against variants not considered VOC, VOI. Right. Variants of concern or variants of interest. And that's because they were doing this trial between January 25th through April 30th of 2021, when the um, alpha variant in particular was the predominant strain in the United States. Yeah. So. And they hope to uh, submit for emergency youth authorization in the third quarter. So that would be July, August and September. So soon and then. By the fourth quarter, some, oh, I can't find it now, some large number of vaccines uh, are promised that will be uh, available, hopefully not just in the U.S., but globally. We may, we may end up giving a lot of this away or at low cost, which would be good. Yeah, that would be really fantastic. Yeah. Um, so it is still a two-dose regimen, um, but... Uh, it seems to be very efficacious and, you know, giving it away uh, could really help out a lot of the places where this pandemic is very much raging. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, mRNA vaccine supply in the U.S. apparently. So uh, this could be used elsewhere where it is very much needed. So that's great. All right. So there's a we'll put a link to this press release and there is a, um, a there is a. Um, a show, not a show, but a <laughs> a talk, okay. um, which you can click, you could go to and see the slides and listen to them talk. There's a link somewhere in here. I forgot. Right. It says it. click here to view multimedia content, including B-roll. <laughs> so, That's yeah, right. And, multimedia content. And yeah. also about halfway through, there's an, also a link as well to the webcast. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, there it is. It's, it's very clear on the PDF. Here we go. Multimedia content. Yeah, they have a bunch of embedded movies and stuff. So we'll and put that I'm not in. sure if I said the TWIV number when we had Matt Freeman on, but it's TWIV 729 if you want to go back and hear more about it. So the, the window for the EUA application is July th third quarter. Wow. Hmm. They're giving themselves some leeway, right? <laughs> July through September. Okay. Uh, yeah, they, they mentioned that they're still looking at Data, they're analyzing data and are working on a preprint. So I wonder if they're looking at you know immune responses and things like that as well. Yeah. Well, there's not much data. We don't have the raw data in the press release, obviously. So it would be nice to see that at some point. Okay, we have two papers for you. We have a snippet first, which has to do with influenza virus vaccines. It is published in Cell, Host, and Microbe, preventing an antigenically disruptive mutation in egg-based HCN2 seasonal influenza vaccines by mutational incompatibility. I'm, I'm just looking at antigenically disruptive mutation. I guess it's okay, right? <laughs> mutation leads to an amino acid change, which is antigenically disruptive. Right. The grammar police are okay with that. I think that that's okay. <laughs> yeah, probably. 
Oh, we could point out, uh, I didn't realize until partway through that this was published in June of 2019. Because they talked about something about it and uh, something about the strains that are, you know, that are recently yeah. something or other. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> then I looked yeah. at the date. This is one of the papers that was on the list <laughs> and is now bubbling to the top, which um, uh, which is fine. This is by a, a large collaborative group, Scripps Research Institute, University of Hong Kong, the... Um, First Affiliated Hospital of Guangzhou Medical University, University of Texas, Austin. And that does it. And we have uh, corresponding authors. We have um, CKPM. Oh, my gosh. We're CK, oh, Chris Mock. CK, Chris Mock. I have to decode it. And Ian Wilson. And it looks like there's one first author, right? Nicholas Wu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of many others. And... This goes back to a story that has been on TWIV already, right? Um, TWIV, uh, what's Scott Hensley, 480. And that's a funny episode because uh, it's the PFU and you're at SHU. <laughs> um, but Scott had, Scott's at UPenn and he had, he had illustrated this with a picture of him, himself with and without hair. Of course, he doesn't have hair. He's bald. But <laughs> he said, this is like what's happening antigenically. To, right. To, you remember right. that? No, you remember yes. that? Yes. That so, cool. Kathy, you want to give us a summary? I, I would like to do that. Yeah. So, you probably all know that most of the vaccines for influenza that we all get are grown in eggs. Although there are possibilities of recombinant vaccines and um, growing them in cell culture. But because of uh, economics, it's still cheapest to grow them in eggs. And also the infrastructure is there. Infrastructure for doing it these other ways isn't, isn't really there yet. Um, and so one of the things that happened when you grow the influenza in the eggs to make the vaccines is that the virus so you've the a group of people figure out which strains need to be grown up for this year's vaccine and so forth. And when those are grown in eggs, the viruses adapt to growing in eggs, having come from people. And growing in eggs makes them become egg adapted. And they can that can generate mutations in their genomes, which lead to amino acid changes in the uh, resulting viruses. And that, those, some of those adaptive changes will result in changing the antigenicity of the virus. So, uh, and it could reduce the effectiveness of the virus if the resulting change is, is negative with respect to antigenicity. So, so would we say that this is one of the reasons why the flu vaccine efficacy sometimes is lower than we might ideally want Right. So there's, as they say in the paper, there's basically two reasons. One is just a frank virus mismatch. That happens occasionally. But this egg-based production can result in low efficacy or effectiveness of the virus. And so in this study, what they did was examine sequences uh, from influenza viruses um, after they've been grown in eggs. Uh, and actually, a lot of this was just database examination, and they found that the two most common egg adaptive mutations uh, resulted in amino acid changes at two sites, but these two changes, which are most frequent, are incompatible with one another. They're mutually exclusive. You either have one or you have the other. And uh, so they go through and they figure out why that is, and the short answer is because of how the how the virus structure interacts with the receptor. And we'll get into that a little bit more, but these two main mutations have the names with letters and numbers, G186V and L194P. And uh, they have a nice graphical abstract that they show you right in the beginning that if you get the G186V, if the virus has that first, 
and it excludes the other egg adaptive mutation from coming into play, that the uh, adaptive changes will not be very deleterious for anagenicity. So I wanted to make myself a mnemonic for that. <laughs> so <laughs> G186V, in my mind, is good G for vaccines V. And then the other mutation is L194P. And if you get that one first, then it's bad for the antigenicity. And so I converted in my mind L194P <laughs> to lousy for protection. Um, you can see how I made it through biology in college. I made a lot of mnemonics. Mm. Um, but um, there's a lot of other uh, sites and stuff, but those are the two main ones, the G186V and the L194P. So that's, and, the, that's and, the overall message. And this, this um, selection, which occurs in eggs that Kathy mentioned, it's because the receptors that the virus, so the hemagglutinin in the spike binds to cell surface receptors and they are different in birds and in humans and humans they're alpha 2 6 linked sialic acids type of sugar um, with a way it's linked to the next sugar and then in in avian cells it's alpha 2 3 so right there you have selection for viruses that are adapted to the alpha 2 3 and then in addition uh, they say that the uh, well, at least for the H3N2 viruses, which are still circulating, that arose that is a a virus that arose in 1968, still circulating. These have are mainly long branched alpha two six uh, sialylated sugars, and that's very different from what's in the egg alpha two three length. In short, they tend to be sure. So there's a pressure for the virus to change to to accommodate the alpha two three, and as Kathy said. If you do L194P, and it's kind of a crapshoot, which is going to happen first, it's lousy for antigenicity. But again, it's fine for binding receptors in the egg. But if G186V happens to come up first, again, it's good for the receptor interaction, but it's also good for antigenicity, good for the vaccine. So, so would this sort of imply that when we are trying to make a vaccine, we could potentially sort of use a parental strain that already has the G186V um, to prevent L194P from emerging. Exactly. That's the bottom line. Yeah. In fact, we don't even have to do the paper now. That's the bottom <laughs> line. What's interesting is you can't start with an H3N2 and introduce G186V because in some countries that would be a genetically modified organism and it's not permitted. So what they said is you could go through... <laughs> And pick a plaque and look and find one that has G186V. In that case, it would be permitted. And then you're right. That one will then not accumulate L194P because, as you will see in this paper, they are incompatible. Um, but they also say there are other changes that are likely arise. We we don't have a complete catalog of all the changes, and it could be that something else arises that you know negates uh, G186V, but. You know, the G186V is good for growth in the egg, so maybe that's enough pressure. Hmm. Okay, so what they did here, as Kathy said, it's mostly uh, examination of databases, although there, there is some wet experimenting as well. There's plenty of sequences of HA proteins in, in GISAID, Global Initiative for Sharing Avian Influenza Data, GISAID.org. And they say from that, you can see there are nine amino acid changes. Although here I will quibble with their description. Nine mutations, namely H156Q, et cetera. Those are not mutations. Nine amino acid changes, namely H156Q, et cetera, were classified as the major egg adaptive changes. And that includes G186V and L194P. Seven of those are located either within or near the re receptor binding site of the hemagglutinin. So remember, the hemagglutinin is a stalk-like protein with, with a stem uh, that's inserted into the viral membrane. And then at the top, there's a globular domain and there's the pocket where the sialic acid binds. So that's the receptor binding site. Every time I see RBS, I want to say ribosome binding site. Yeah, I don't know, I do it's too. kind of wired into me. <laughs> 
except their binding site. So these changes are either in it or close. And that makes sense, right? Because they are selected to be able to allow the HA to bind the avian sialic acids in, in the chicken egg. Um, and and um, in this paper, they want to know what's going on. And you've heard Kathy summarize it. So they, they, they noticed in this database that uh, G186V and L194P are never together. So they said, can we make a virus that has both of these just to see if that's correct? And they have a way of doing that for influenza virus. Um, uh, you have to make eight plasmids representing the eight RNA segments. And it's, it's rather complicated, but each plasmid will make both the minus and the plus stranded RNA. And you put those all eight plasmids in a cell and then out will come influenza virus. So that that's what they mean by a virus rescue. And I'm so happy that they called it virus rescue and not something else, which I will not. The, 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 the technique that will not be named, it's kind of like, um, what's Voldemort. the guy? Voldemort. Tiger. And in fact, um, they cannot rescue a virus with both G186V and L194P together. They're incompatible. Um, they could do the single ones, but not the two. So they say the evolutionary trajectories are influenced by whichever comes first. So they did a second experiment to address that. They start with G186V, a virus where they've put that in, and they start pass it, passing it from egg to egg. They never see L194P emerging. Of course, after three passages, they don't see it. <laughs> never is too strong. Maybe if you did it forever, who knows? But that would have generated a lot of possibility. possibility. Yeah. Right. And, and at least... You know, as I look at these data, um, I thought that this was a particularly important experiment um, because it addressed the question I had even from the graphical abstract, um, where I could sort of tell where they were going to go. Mm. And I wondered how frequently G186V um, could sort of revert back um, to the ancestral yeah. uh, sequence, which then would be perfectly free well, to sure, sure. Uh, become L194P. And so from these data, it, you know, in five passages, it seems as though they, they're they showing 100% frequency of um, G186V remaining. Um, so they're not seeing a, a lot of back reversion, at least from what I'm seeing here. Of course, it wouldn't make sense to back revert because the G186V is allowing it to better bind the, the alpha-2,3 sialic acid receptor, right? right? So going back wouldn't be... It, it wouldn't make sense, you'd but expect. you'd certainly want to check that yeah. before you try a vaccine strategy based on this. But what is good from this is they see other changes arising in that are known to be egg adapting, right? In mm -hmm. any particular passage, temp, over 10%, which is good. So it shows you that they're putting some pressure on the virus in this passage. Now, the other experiment is when you start with L194P and pass it in eggs, nothing, no change goes over 10%. And certainly they don't see um, G186V. So they say this means they're pretty much incompatible. Although I could imagine a third change arising that would allow them to be compatible maybe. Although as you'll see in a moment, the, the effects that these two changes have on the receptor binding site are opposite. So it might be hard for that to happen. But anyway, it's an interesting... Um, Finding. So what do these changes do? Well, they do a series of uh, experiments. They do some structural studies of the HA, the solved crystal structures of these uh, HAs. Some of them have been uh, done before. Uh, and they also look at structures with sialic acids in them. And basically what happens is that the G186V change makes the receptor binding site bigger. It increases these two structural elements, um, the distance between them in the receptor binding site, uh, and uh, make, makes a bigger receptor binding site, basically. Presumably that accommodates the alpha-2,3 uh, sialic acid. Uh, in contrast, 
L194P makes the receptor binding site smaller, the opposite effect of G186V, which is interesting because remember, in both cases, they're leading to better interaction with alpha-2,3 uh, sialic acids. And they actually find that the L194P change really uh, decreases the binding of um, the HA to alpha-2,3 sialic acids, which they say uh, it shows you don't need very much, very strong binding in the chicken eggs to get reasonable reproduction. And I like that. That's an important point because, you know, when the SARS-CoV-2 um, narrative, everyone gets excited when the apparent binding infinity of spike goes up, but <laughs> it doesn't always mean that that's going to do anything. It might not be, it might be uh, excessive. So they're doing, these changes are doing, having, having opposite effects. So uh, does that mean that that adaptive change has some other effect? I mean, that, that L194P has some other effect that's not just related to the receptor binding site? Or no, I think I the think change, change in the shape of the pocket is, a, is better accommodating 2,3. It happens to be getting smaller, but it doesn't matter for 2,3, right? Uh, because the H3 and 2, as they say previously, has adapted to long chain alpha 2,6s in people. And so this, for alpha 2,3, you don't need it to be such an open pocket, I think. So I think it's compatible. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out why it's why it's egg adaptive to have the L one ninety four P then if it's but yeah I, that's I a good question. I mean I don't really see an answer for, to that here. I I may be missing it because they do have the structure, but I think that the small size of the site is fine for alpha two three. Um, then they um. Well, the double, the, the double mutant with the two amino acid changes, they can put both of those, the virus doesn't grow, but they can put both changes into the HA, right? And make the protein and do the structure of the protein. And so when they do doing that- they're chemistry. They're not doing do, virology. Yeah, that's right. Just make the protein so you don't have to grow the virus. Now the receptor binding site is a mess. <laughs> it's disordered, as they say and um, cannot bind sialic acid. And maybe that's in part why the uh, virus doesn't reproduce. And they also say the antigenic site. Well, by the way, the receptor binding site overlaps with major antigenic site of the virus. And so when you mess with the receptor binding site, which you do when you select for better reproduction in the egg, you're messing with that antigenic site, as we have said. And in the double amino acid HA, the RBS is disrupted and the antigenicity is disrupted. The antigenic site is disrupted as well. Although they, they weren't able to, they didn't look at that with antibodies, um, which, which they do for the single changes, as you'll see in a moment. All right, so then they do a series of experiments where they look at the antigenicity. This has been studied a lot previously we know for, from previous work that the L194P, lousy for- Protection. Protection. I'm not good with mnemonics, see, I don't know. <laughs> I got the lousy part, I'm, I, you know, <laughs> lousy for protection. Uh, you know, you can immunize animals and get sera and see how they neutralize. And they've shown that the antigenicity is altered. Um, whereas G168V, confers minimal antigenic differences. And I think you can imagine how those experiments would be done, but they do some others here. They have inoculated ferrets. Actually, this is a previous work also. Inoculate ferrets with a virus carrying G186V, and you can take that sear and say, how well does it react with wild type virus or with other HA variants? And they say, uh, anisir, ferret anisir against G186V, uh, have only a two-fold decrease in hemagglutination inhibition. So this is an assay that's frequently used to look at sera. They, they also do neutralization, but hemagglutination inhibition is another way where, you know, these viruses will cross-link red blood cells and, and, and cause hemagglutination. And you can add antisera and look at the inhibition of that. So antisera to G186V virus, only two-fold decrease in 
uh, inhibiting HII in wild type virus. Um, they, they, here in this paper, what they did, they had sera from six mice that were immunized with a Brisbane virus, which is a, uh, it's actually a, uh, a vaccine virus. It's got the HA and the NA on a PR8 backbone, which allows it to grow well in eggs. So the PR8 strain of influenza virus, uh, isolated in the 30s, grows really well in eggs. And so whenever you want to make a vaccine, you just reassort the HA and NA genes into that, and it grows really well. So that's what Brisbane 7 is. It's H3N2 on the PR8 backbone. And they immunize mice with that. It's wild type, and then they ask, how does it do HAI with G1A6V, with L194P proteins? And they say for all serum samples, binding to G81, G8, G1A6V was almost as good as to wild type, but binding to L194 was always weaker. So that is showing you the idea that G186V ha exhibits minimal antigenic change, whereas L194P doesn't. And you don't want an L194P. That's the bottom line. Yeah, it's lousy. <laughs> so here's a, I want to introduce this word I don't think we've ever talked about, epistasis. Non-additivity of mutational fitness effects is known as epistasis. So G186V confers fitness... In, at the level of receptor interaction, right? Better interaction with alpha-2,3 sialic acids in the egg. Same thing for L194P. But when you put them together, it's not additive. In this case, it was lethal, right? So that's called epistasis. So they say this study demonstrates that epistasis exists between egg adaptive mutations in the HA uh, in the receptor binding site. That's a lovely word, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it's also just a lovely concept. Non-additivity of mutational fitness. So any change that gives better fitness, um, it's not additive. I think that would be an ex interesting experiment to do with some of these uh, spike changes in the SARS-CoV-2 variants, right, that haven't been observed together. Many of them are observed together, like the Delta variant is has a few changes that are, have been observed in other variants. So obviously there's no epistasis there, right? Or maybe it is. Maybe it's not additive. That would still be epistasis. It right. doesn't have to be inhibitory, right? Just non-additive. Yeah, they could be influencing completely different things. Um. Yeah. So they say the idea, as Brian said originally, is we can put another egg adaptive change in and take advantage of epistasis to prevent the bad changes, which means the lousy changes from occurring. But, uh, you know, in countries that don't allow GMOs, you can't do that. So they say multiple egg adapted isolates from the same parental strain could be plaqued and sequenced. And, the, and you, you find, you know, L194P, um, and then you start with that. Isn't that weird that you could do that? No, you'd want to start with the GV one. Sorry, it's GV. But isn't it weird that you can... Do that, but you can't introduce it. You can't genetically modify it. I don't know well, what. At least there's ways. Yeah, we can get around that. But they do say that, you know, in the long run, we have to get away from eggs, which I think is a good idea. Yes. Um, you know, the I'm, I'm, they actually mention... Uh, an interesting approach, a dual HA influenza virus to allow efficient vaccine production in eggs without adaptation. That's interesting, right? One HA is already adapted to eggs and the other is non-adapted and they you won't get selections. That's a great idea. That was published in 2017. Yeah, I was wondering if we're going to go back and do that sometime. <laughs> it could be fun, right? Yeah. Um, and of course, there are cell-based vaccines, but they're harder to, to produce. Right. Um, I, I, my flu vaccine this past year uh, was a cell-based vaccine for the first time ever. I got the uh, sheet from them after I had been vaccinated yeah. and was very excited to read that I had gotten a cell-based vaccine. Was it flu cell vax? It was flu cell vax. Yeah, I think I got that too. But I got the old man's version or the old person's version, you know, the double dose. 
Um, she, the lady who injected me said, I'm, a, I'm sorry to have to tell you, you need the old person's. <laughs> she said, I know how old I am. So I convinced her to start listening to TWIV. This was like last, last fall. So then they say, you know, the ultimate solution will be a universal vaccine. Yeah, but you know, what, is it gonna be an mRNA based vaccine where you don't have to grow it in eggs at all? Who knows? I mean, that's, that'll be interesting to see when that, we'll definitely cover that paper. Okay. Everybody happy? Cool story. Yes. I think it's a cool story, yeah. Meriting. And soon it's, we will have to get our next flu vaccine. Twivable. Soon, man, what, we're in June, you mean like September-ish? Yeah. October? Yeah. Well, you know, if you're elderly, you tend to go in August. They become available in August. And, um, you know, the drugstores have signs outside and you go. And then if you're older, by January, it's waned. And you don't you don't get a lot of protection, and that's part of the problem. In older people, it wanes very quickly, and uh, they have to solve that problem too. Can't just make universal. You have to figure out the waning issue. But uh, if you remember the paper we did from Rafia Med's group, where you know in mice, if you don't use an adjuvant in a flu vaccine, there's very little memory um, B cells produce. So, but you know some of these do have uh, adjuvants. So I don't know what the story is. All right, uh, uh, for a paper, well, we are back to SARS-CoV-2, but this is cool because it addresses something that, well, certainly Daniel Griffin has talked about it a lot. We've all heard about it, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. This is a paper from the Journal of Clinical Investigation, which is open access. And the title is multi MISC is driven by zonulin dependent loss of gut mucosal barrier. And this is um, a group of institutions, Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's. The, um, I love this one, the WIS Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. <laughs> That's cool, the Reagan Institute. Um, Cedar sinai Medical Center. Ooh, in the, oh, the European Biomedical Research Institute of Salerno. Okay, so what do we have here? Cor a lot of three corresponding alt authors, Fasano, Walt, and Yonker. And as far as I see, mm, yes, we have two pound signs. So three, three first authors, Lael Yonker, Tal Gilboa, and Alana Ogata. And then we had those two, Walt and Fasano, uh, corresponding authors. Um, and on this paper, I recognize George Church and Moshe Arditi and Galit Alter. Moshe Arditi, as you will see, um, his group, his group works on Kawasaki's, Kawasaki disease and he identified a super antigen in the spike protein of um, SARS-CoV-2, and I've asked, asked him to come on and talk about this. I'd like to, we, we should have a, a super antigen person on. Yeah, I, I think that some of the ideas that come out of what could be going on with Spike as a super antigen are really, really fascinating. Um, and his paper also has Shiv Palai, who has done a lot of work with B cells and antibodies. Yes. So as you know, um, man, many kids, uh, who get infected with SARS-CoV-2 have uh, mild respiratory disease, but some can develop weeks, days to weeks after resolution, um, this illness, which can be very severe, multi-system inflammatory system syndrome in children or MIS-C, which is an immune activation disease. And uh, these, these patients have fever, GI issues, cytokine storm, myo heart issues, um, and they say they are reminiscent of Kawasaki disease, but there's certain, and toxic shock syndrome, which some of you may remember, caused by a bacterium, uh, but they're, di they're different enough to be distinct. And 80% 80, 80 of these kids develop heart pathologies and so forth. And we really don't understand what's going on. And then they do say something, um, which I just wanted to bring up. And they, they said that 
you know, the number of infections in this young group is increasing, right? And J Daniel Griffin has said the same thing as well. And I wonder, I mean, I thought maybe part of the reason is that, well, first, they're the least vaccinated of all age groups, right? 12 and under so far. Right. Maybe that's part of it. And also that we don't test them very much, right? <laughs> so I, I don't know why it's increasing. Um, but... Um, yeah, is it that absolute numbers are increasing or is it that the other populations are decreasing? So it's a, is it a proportional thing or absolute numbers? So they call it prevalence. Does that tell you? So, yeah, prevalence. Well. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess not. No, let's look it up. I mean, prevalence is, prevalence is the number of cases total. Total number of cases existing in a population. In the population, right. yeah. Yeah, I don't think that addresses your question there. Anyway, so this um, is an inflammatory disease. We don't understand what drives it. There's some, as, as I mentioned, there's a super antigen-like um, motif near the cleavage site on the spike. It's thought that this might be driving the, the inflammatory response. Um, as, so, Brianna, a super antigen is a sequence that tickles one T cell receptor, right? Um, it's a little bit broader than that. So mm -hmm. a super antigen is usually a protein coming from some kind of pathogen. Um, there are viral and bacterial super antigens. And they bind to um, a part of the T cell receptor, usually the uh, V beta chain. Okay, okay. Um, so it's, one, it's part of the T cell receptor, but it's not quite the part where we're binding antigen. And so it's not specific to one T cell receptor. It's going to be specific to uh, a whole class of T cell receptors that used the same part in making the T cell receptor. Um, okay. And so okay. um, in the end, you're going to turn on T cells in a non-antigen specific way. All T cell receptors that have that structure um, in them will get okay. turned on. Um, by the antigen presenting cell, whether or not their cognate antigen is present. So, you have, so you're going to have a more robust T cell response, essentially. Yeah, in right? some cases, you can get up to like 20% of T cells yeah. um, that are actually okay. getting activated, um, which obviously made uh, a whole lot of cytokines and a whole lot of disruption to the yeah. immune response. And in the case of toxic shock caused by Staphylococcus, right? Mm -hmm. There is a super antigen in that bacterium as well. Yeah, right? Staphylococcus. Uh, uh, have multiple super antigens. Okay. Um, the most uh, famous is uh, Staph enterotoxin A or SEA, right. uh, but also toxic shock syndrome toxin um, yeah. is another of the really famous ones. Right. Now, what's interesting here is that when, when in most of the MISC cases, you cannot find SARS-CoV-2 in the, in the nasopharyngeal swab. So, you know, by all intents, your infection is over and then days to weeks later, the kids develop this, so what's going on? And, you know, there's some idea that, uh, well, we know that in adults with, uh, with COVID, sometimes they can have GI issues, right? Um, and so they're wondering, could the GI issues be driving um, MISC in kids? In particular, is the gut becoming more permeable somehow? And that lets in uh, various uh, antigens, viral antigens, which in might include a super antigen, maybe even bacterial antigens, and that may drive an inflammatory state. Kind of like HIV, right, uh, Brie, and HIV AIDS, you have that permeability of the gut and that drives uh, inflammatory response. Yeah, right? absolutely. So there, there's a uh, sort of hyperinflammation and um, LPS is leaking from the gut. Um, right. And you get LPS anemia, you get LPS in the blood, and that's not good, right? Because that's right, a great exactly. trigger of inflammation. And so that's right? triggering inflammation. Exactly. Yeah. I actually wondered how you felt about one of the sentences they had in the introduction <laughs> about this, where they say, in adults, there's increased recognition that the gut serves as a nidus for SARS-CoV-2. No, I think it avoids saying that it's reproducing there, right? It does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do it, say at the end, we can't prove that it's reproducing there. We need more work. And I think that's a fine way to put it, right? Uh, if they said the virus is reproducing there, that wouldn't be correct because we don't have that data, right? And if you remember, Paul B. Nash and Theodora Hatsianu had some suggestion that there's persistence of antigen in the gut in, in adults, right? From 
some some sampling that they had done. But I don't think there's any good proof that there's virus reproduction. So Anitas, I think, is okay. Yeah. yeah that's a nice use of, of the English language, I think. I like when, when people just depart from the norm. All right, so what did they do here? They have specimens from 100 kids. Uh, 19 had clinical diagnosis of MISC. Uh, 26 had COVID, PCR confirmed COVID-19, and 55 were non-COVID controls. 32 of those were pre-pandemic. So these are obviously samples they've had for a while. Average age with, uh, with children with MISC is eight years old. The COVID kids were 14. And the MISC patients uh, presented with a median of three days of acute symptoms associated with MIS after a previous COVID exposure or SARS-CoV-2 infection, 26 days prior to MISC, range of 13 to 62 days. GI symptoms predominant in the MISC cohort. 89% of these patients had GI symptoms compared to 27% with COVID-19. Okay. So just to emphasize that again, so more GI symptoms in the kids with the MISC yeah. than in kids who have COVID-19. 89% compared to 27%. The p-value is 0. 0.0001 <laughs> if you are liking p-values. Okay, so um, they look at... Um, so they say most children with MIS have negative nasopharyngeal swabs. So somehow this is not related to respiratory infection. So what they do is they measure uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA in stool samples, which were collected weeks after the initial SARS-CoV-2 infection. And um, most of their patients had viral RNA in the stool from uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 2 to 2.5 times 10 to the seventh RNA copies per milliliter. And they say, suggesting an ongoing needus of infection. Now there, Brianne, they're a little more conclusive, aren't they? Uh-huh. <laughs> a needus of infection. They didn't say that before. I don't know if it suggests a needus of infection. You know, we have talked about how RNA can stick around a long time, right? After the infection's over. Yep. So that could be going on. All right. So now they, they get into the gut permeability. So they say a large, an intact mucosal barrier should prevent antigens from getting into the blood, right? And zonulin, a family of proteins that uh, can regulate intestinal permeability uh, at the at the tight junctions that the that join the cells, um, and they say that you know you you can see increased zonulin in the circulation correlating with increased intestinal permeability in a variety of diseases like celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and Kawasaki disease. That's interesting. I didn't know that. So zonulin release can cause perme per trafficking of large inflammatory antigens from the gut into the bloodstream. So, you know, think of the cells lining the gut, they're tightly joined, and if zonulin um, is present, the Junctions will open up and then proteins can get into the blood. So they looked and they said, do these kids with MISC have more zonulin in their circulation? And they looked at that by mass spec. S um, and they, do, they find that. They find increased um, levels of zonulin in, in, in MISC children. They also find increased levels of LPS. In the, this is in the circulation in the blood which would be consistent with, um, you know, decreased mucosal barrier in the gut. So and again, suggesting that the bacteria are maybe getting out, bacteria being the source of the lipopolysaccharide LPS. Right. And none of the, and then another marker, CD14, marker of microbial translocation. Do you know anything about that, Priyan? Um, so it is actually involved in, uh, so they're, they're looking here at LPS binding protein and CD14, I kind of think of as another LPS binding protein. It's involved in LPS signaling. Okay. None of these markers were elevated in uh, the acute COVID-19 children. So no MISC in those kids. So this suggests that maybe things are getting into circulation from the gut, right? Could be viral components or other and bacteria as well. 
So then um, they say, what's in the, what else is in the blood? They say, can we find viral proteins in the blood? So we know there's virus in the blood, viremia, and viral proteins would be antigenemia. <laughs> right. Emia being the key suffix. So in anything emia comes from, I think, of from heme, eme. Mm. So yep. antigenemia is that there's antigens. So they say viremia has not been detected in MISC, but no one has looked at antigenemia in MISC kids. So they use um, an assay to look for SARS-CoV-2 spike, the S1 part of spike, and the nucleocapsid in, the, in plasma of children with MISC. And remember, we're weeks past the initial exposure. Um, but they look for it and they find it. It's the spike is elevated in MISC compared to controls uh, and COVID-19 kids. Also the S1 protein, remember the S1 is released by cleavage at the S1, S2 site by proteases and that's up as well. Uh, and the nucleocapsid is also increased, but less so. I was really surprised when I looked at these data mm. um, to see the magnitude of spike um, and S1 in the blood yeah. um, compared to the LPS or the zonulin differences because the, they're statistically significantly different mm. um, for the, the permeability. But if you look at the, the spread of the data, it doesn't look sort of dramatic to your eye. Yeah. But then spike, you look at and it looks dramatic. Um, and so it's impressive kind of how much of a difference there is. Yeah. Um, and S1 um, is not present in some of the vaccines because that it's only in the post fusion. It's only in the pre fusion, right? Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be liberated. That's right. Yeah. Yep. So they say this this suggests that um, somehow the viral proteins are getting out of infected tissues and they think it's coming from the GI tract. The, then they, they talk about the spike, the S1 part of spike having a super antigen. Um, and they say, um, our data reveal a strong correlation between S1 antigenemia and the previously reported production of a particular T cell receptor, uh, T cell beta variable gene TRBV11-2, which has previously been shown to be elevated in these kids. So that would suggest, Brianne, that the superantigen is somehow interacting, interacting with, that, with that one, right? Interacting with that V-beta um, that's used to yeah. structure the T-cell receptor. So then you would see an expansion of cells with that particular beta, right? Right, exactly. Which is what they because saw previously, yeah. They're, they are bound by the superantigen yeah. that activates those T-cells and they start to divide. So you have a correlation between S1 and TRBV11-2, but not spike or nucleocapsid in TRBV11-2. Is that is that um, surprising or not surprising, Brian? So if the so S should have the super antigen. So why would S1? Would it just be available in S1 or what? I, I think it would probably be available and able to bind more easily. Um, hmm. And you know, I don't know things like the frequency of how much of that spike that they're putting in becomes converted to S1 or things like that. Yeah. Hmm. These kids also have what they call cytokine storm. So some people still use the term. Uh, they measure IL-1 beta, IL-6, IL-10, TNF alpha. They also have elevated interferon gamma. But it's interesting because in adults, this interferon gamma can be suppressed. So here, a, little, a while after the initial infection, this is up. And then antibodies. They look at antibodies in these kids. And they say that the um, in the MISC patients, the IgM, IgG, and IgA against spike were the most high, spike in S1 were the most highly ele elevated. And they say that corresponds with the antigens we most frequently find in the bloodstream uh, of these kids. And they say anti-spike remains higher than would be expected, given that this is weeks after the original exposure. Although they do say it is going down. 
Do you think you have any thoughts about that, Brianne? Why well, would that well, be? Well, so I mean, if if you have too many T cells activated, or if you have mm -hmm. a lot of T cells activated, those T cells are going to activate more B cells. They're going to be producing more cytokines that can act as growth factors um, for those okay. B cells. And um, anti spike, anti S one IgG, and anti RBDIG are the highest in the delayed onset MISC. IgA, spike IgA, S1 IgA, and RBD IgA are all significantly increased in MISC. And anti-spike IgA remains, this is their word, unexpectedly elevated for months after the initial infection. So they say this must be, you know, ongoing antigenic exposure in mucosal surfaces. So it could be, in, there's nothing in the respiratory tract, right? Because these kids are nasopharyngeal RT-PCR negative. So it must be another mucosal site, which they think is the gut. There's viral antigens there that are somehow uh, keeping these an these uh, antibodies being produced. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't show us that it's an viral antigen. Um, and so you can't say that, well, maybe it's just not a whole lot of T cell helper cytokines yeah. helping out those B cells. Uh, to keep them around, um, but uh, that's that's so that's one I guess issue. But uh, it is yeah. suggestive of antigen. They do uh, some neutralization assays, the plasma neutralization capacity. Um, they say neutralization titers were comparable between children from both groups, which is interesting because they said before that the IgG levels are higher, right? And so. They're saying that there's more IgG, but not all of it is neutralizing. Ineffective neutralization, poor antigen clearance, ongoing viral antigen leakage, they think is is contributing to the inflammation. Right. But if if that those antibodies are predominantly against S1 instead of other parts of spike, then perhaps they wouldn't be neutralizing. Yeah, they said that anti-S is is uh, elevated as well, right? Anti-spike and anti-S1 IgG are both high. So, you know, I think you have both. But they don't really talk about that very much. Yeah, they don't really talk about that. And, and you could get into whether or not the anti-spike contains S1 and other uh, epitope or yeah. whether it's just anti-S1 yeah. Sort of what exactly that elevated anti-spike means. So they did some longitudinal studies in these kids. Um, they, they note that in adults, you can get antigenemia, but it's typically early um, and associated with pulmonary symptoms. Um, but in MISC, the antigenemia is associated with GI symptoms much later. So they did multi-samples. They look at um, antigen over time since MISC symptom onset. So they say in adults, it's known that the viral antigens are rapidly cleared uh, as seroconversion happens. But in these kids, spike rises over the first few days of MISC and persists for greater than 10 days, occasionally through six months, despite seroconversion. Right, so you, these kids should have cleared um, their antigens, but in at symptom onset, they're going up again. The high presence of spike in seroconverted patients is never, it was not observed in any adult COVID-19 cases. And um, interesting, they had treated um, at least one of these kids with steroids and immunoglobulin replacement therapy, which are the currently recommended treatments for uh, MISC, but that didn't change the antigen levels, those treatments. And they say that these therapies are, are targeting the downstream consequences, right? The inflammatory responses, but they're not hitting the source of the antigenemia, which is perhaps why they don't work. Right. And, and so it's important to note here that when they're measuring spike, they're measuring spike in the plasma. Yes. Um, yes. And so um, this may not be, you know, spike that's coming from active replication in the respiratory tract. Obviously these these kids don't have that. Yeah. This is that leaking spike. And That's so right. they say they From don't the see the, the spike um, in the plasma of adults. And so perhaps adults are not having the same kind of leaky gut 
right. um, leading to the spike that in the plasma that the kids are having. And why that is, is an interesting question, right? That's, exactly. You say that that needs to be investigated. So then they have this interesting case where they, um, they say, they say, okay, if zonulin is uh, involved in gut permeability, um, maybe, well, we have a drug that is an antagonist of zonulin. It's called lirazotide. It's an investigational drug. It's in phase three trials for celiac. Uh, it seems to have a good safety profile. So they applied for compassionate use to a 17-month-old boy with MISC, which this poor kid had all kinds of problems. A lot of other other yeah, issues, issues, right? They call it a complex past medical history. Um, so he had other diseases. Then he got COVID and he had respiratory failure, cardiac resuscitation, all, all kinds of things. Um, he was treated with intravenous IG, steroids, didn't really recover, but they did find 10 to the three copies of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in stool, a uh, spike in plasma at 566 picograms per ml over two weeks after the uh, initiation of IG and steroid treatment. So they decided to treat him with larazotide uh, every six hours. And uh, he, um, you know, his, his CRP levels dropped. Um, his spike dropped 90% um, after initiation of therapy. Nuclear caps had dropped by 98%. Fever improved. D-dimer improved. Cytokines went down. Um, and he, he achieved his longest stretches without fever since admission. His GI symptoms improved and he was able to resume full feeds. His ventilatory, ventilatory status improved as well. So at this point, when I was reading this paper, I wrote down, like David Fagenbaum, that he, they figured out the underlying cause, yeah. and then they looked, and there's this experimental drug, and they tried it, and now they're going to need to do uh, randomized controlled trials. That's right. But That's right. It, it just seemed very parallel to me. Yeah. I, I also found it interesting that it looks like I guess the anakinra was given before the latrozonide. For some reason, at one point, yeah. I couldn't tell if it was before or if it was at the same time. Um, but I guess it looks like it's before. It's yeah, the, the IVIG, the steroids, the and the anakinra okay. were all given earlier. Yeah, I, I, did, I guess they didn't work, so they decided to try this based on their um, their data so far. Which is, you know, that's the David Feigenbaum approach. You get some data, and you decide. And they did here. They thought that. Uh, the and, permeability. And in this case, they had to get the, it as compassionate use. Yeah. Yep. Um, also, this uh, lorazotide, uh, I did the rich thing. I looked it up in Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. eight amino acid peptide that functions as a tight junction regulator, reversing leaky junctions. But the eight amino acids are found in the zonulin protein. Hmm. So it makes you think about how it you know, if it's some kind of competition, you know, as how it's inhibiting the, the zonulin from Interesting. getting released. So in the, in the graphical abstract, they have zonulin binding, looks like a receptor, right? And um, maybe it is, the peptide binds, but doesn't do the same, you know, maybe it's a antagonist, right? Yeah, I, I'm just curious about what other clinical conditions zonulin inhibition might be used for. It looks like celiac. Right. Yeah, inflammatory bowel. Yeah. Those kinds of things, yeah. Um, I, I wonder what happened to the kid. I hope, I hope he survived. But they do say, um, yeah, we should do a trial for this, um, for zonulin um, inhibitors for uh, MISC. Brianne, I had a question. Um, when they go through the discussion, it's all pretty straightforward. Um, they, they, you know, they talk again about the superantigen um, and the TRBV11-2 skewing. But are there any consequences of that? Can we can we do anything based on that? Um, 
to my knowledge, I, you know, I don't think I can't think of anything specific that we'd be able to do. Really, what you need to do in those cases is get rid of the super antigen um, so mm-hmm. that you stop those T cells. Um, so, you know, some he's probably also you know, getting so much T cell activation that some of those T cells may be um, either getting deleted or getting exhausted. And so he may kind of eventually lose function mm. of T cells with that V beta. Mm. Um, and he's just generally going to have um, a cytokine storm. Um, but I'm not sure that there's anything that we're going to be able to do with um, that knowledge of the V-beta. because Just because um, we're turning on the T-cells with that V-beta, um, that doesn't mean that those are actually SARS-CoV-2-specific T-cells. Mm. They mm. could be specific to anything. It just so happens that the structure of their T-cell receptor includes this one part. But they're not self T cells, right? Because those have been eliminated. The, um, they, I mean, the very self T cells have been eliminated. Mm. And so some of them might be, you know, minor self yeah. T cells. Yeah, okay. um, <laughs> so in that case, you know, maybe you're expanding some self T cells. Right. Uh, that could be. A so they say this the, the super antigen motif in, in S1 is very similar to the staph XLB super antigen motif. That's interesting that's involved in toxic shock. So the idea here is that the gut is the beginning. You somehow have viral, a nidus of virus persistence in the gut. We don't know if it's reproducing or that. And and they say actually uh, extensive tissue studies are necessary to provide direct evidence of GI reproduction of the virus. So they agree that we don't know. But that... uh, What is leading to the zonulin production and permeability? So yeah, that's that's the key question. And and why is there zonulin uh, production in kids yeah. and maybe not so much in these adults? They do point out that mm. increased severity of acute COVID-19 in adults is associated with increased GI symptoms. And so maybe this is just been under the radar, and maybe it is a feature there as well. So it is not necessarily a, a consequence of having SARS-CoV-2 in the gut, right? Right. But when zonulin is made and it opens up the gut, then the SARS-CoV-2 proteins go in the gut and they cause inflammation as well as maybe some bacterial proteins, right? Well, it's more that, it's not that they go into the gut, it's that I'm they sorry. leave the gut. They go, go into, into the bloodstream, yeah. And the the... Presumably, uh, Brianne, the super antigens are doing their thing in the in lymph nodes, right? That would be the idea, yes. Mm. So they may be, so, you know, you could imagine that maybe the super antigen is doing something in the lymph node. Some T cell that gets expanded yeah. happens to either directly um, influence zonulin or sort of indirectly influence zonulin. Or maybe the right. cytokines are influencing it. So that, that's harder. They to talk. talk a little bit about Kawasaki disease, another inflammatory disease that has some some similarities to MISC. So there's a mouse model uh, for this. Uh, they say there's a mouse model of Kawasaki where in te- increased intestinal permeability has been associated with higher levels of circulating IgA and deposition in les- cardiovascular lesions. And they say in the mouse, if you block intestinal permeability with um, lorez- lorazotide, is that the same one that we used here, AT1001? Anyway, inhibitor of zonulin. I believe so, yes. You get uh, reduced uh, cardiovascular lesions. So hmm. it's a kind of a link between the two. Well, you could imagine if there is plasma leakage of LPS and other things, that's going to cause a lot of physiological problems, yeah. um, inflammation in a lot of parts of the body. And so that could be a part of some of the pathology that's being seen here. So one interesting thing to me is that, you know, I think this is a journal geared toward clinicians. Yep. yep. And so after the, uh, where is it? It's in the abstract, then they have the concluding sentence in the abstract, but then they have the brief summary. Yep. In MISC, increased gastrointestinal mucosal permeability allows SARS-CoV-2 antigens in the GI tract 
to leak into the bloodstream, triggering cytokine storm and hyperinflammatory responses. So if they don't have to read the whole paper, they can just read the brief summary. <laughs> There's even a conclusion at the end of the discussion. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> that is shown here, advance our understanding of MISC, revealing potential biomarkers and pathways for treating and preventing. I think it's pretty exciting. Yeah, the idea that zonulin is a biomarker uh, or these, or I guess the CD14 or the uh, LPS binding protein you know, the viral antigenemia too, right? Because that's not there in, a, in acute COVID, so. Right, and, and I think, you know, there have been um, some reports around that have suggested a super antigen um, being part of this virus, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, none of them have been sort of super obvious, at least to, to what I've seen. And so this is also a very nice suggestion when they show these changes in that T-cell uh, B beta usage um, that further, you know, say in humans, this can be a super antigen. Um, and I, I certainly hope that we are able to um, have uh, somebody who's working on that come because I, I have a, my, my list of questions is very long. So Bri Brian, you might've just said this, but let me ask it. Is there any indication that super antigen of SARS-CoV-2 has any role in pathogenesis early, you know, before MISC in the regular COVID? Um, I, I think that there are speculations about that, okay. but I don't think that there's any evidence that has shown it for sure okay. yet. Okay. Nice. In addition to the abstract, the summary, the conclusion, and so forth, they also have the graphical abstract, yeah. and then yeah. they have a final model figure at the end also. So you could, just a lot of ways to get the message from this paper. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. It's a good picture of a kid, right, with uh, the gut opening up. And then we have SARS-CoV-2 virus in the gut. We have RNA also there. I think this could happen without reproduction, right? Just persistence of particles for whatever reason. Yeah, the Journal of Clinical Investigation does a nice job. I was on their editorial board. So what they do is the editorial board moves from institution to institution every five years or so. And it was here at Columbia for a while. And actually, so they get people from the local institution to be part of the editorial board, right? And Beth Levine was on it and then she moved. So they asked me to join, you know, halfway through and I mean, I, I'm not a clinician, but they, they do get a lot of basic virology. And so what you would do is get the submissions and decide whether to send them out for review. And then when the reviews come, we would actually meet in person every week and discuss them. It's kind of nice. Um, That's cool. But um, I thought it was fair and um, uh, well organized. And I, after us, I think it went to Penn. I don't know where it is anymore. Yeah, JCI Insight is here at U of M, but that's different from JCI. What's that? Is that a separate journal? Uh, it's a sub-journal. <laughs> I mean, a okay. spin-off journal. I, yeah. All right, let's do some email. Uh, Kathy, can you take that first one? Oh, I wanted to just do one little follow-up oh, yeah, uh, sure. sure. from last week. I mentioned the business columnists' articles that I thought were really good about discussing the SARS-CoV-2 origins, and I mistakenly said that he writes for the New York Times. In fact, I meant to say he writes for the LA Times. It's Michael Hiltzik of the Los Angeles Times. Right. So worth checking out his column. But he lives in Brooklyn. Does he? Yeah, I talked to him and uh, he <laughs> said, could we get together and chat in person? Some, he said, I had some more questions and I said, nah, anytime. I can meet you downtown. And he said, yeah, I'm in Brooklyn, but I can make it in. <laughs> <laughs> so did did he hear about you from TWIV? I mean, from this TWIV bump or no? Just, this was a while ago. No, it was just a few weeks ago, but just before this article. Um, How did he hear? I don't know. Hmm, okay. I think it's mostly through TWIV, right? Yeah, yeah. Because more people are listening and they, they get it, yeah. Um. Actually, he was very good. Yes, it was through TWIV because he said, I saw the um, WHO committee episode and he said, could you send me a few 
TWIV episodes where you address the lab leak hypothesis. So I sent him a couple because he wanted to listen to them before he spoke to me, which I thought was great. That's that's impressive. And then a week later, we talked and um, and then he said, I, I have some papers I don't understand. I wonder, you know, do you have a student who I could sit down with? And I said, well, you could sit down with me. I don't have any students, but um, and he said, OK, I'll come in from Brooklyn. So, <laughs> all right. Okay, Kathy, go ahead. First email. Monica writes, hi, all. Thank you so much for all your good work and clear explanations. I have a Master of Science degree, but in a field far away from viruses, pandemics, medicine, and vaccinations. But when the pandemic hit, my way of coping with the anxiety and stress levels was to get good quality information. That's how I found you and others, and it really helped me a lot. So thanks for that. In the summer of 2020, I had the chance to be part of a phase three trial for a vaccine, and I eagerly wanted to be part of the solution. I knew then a lot about this specific vaccine, had the chance to talk to doctors within the trial and also some who volunteered for the trial themselves. And I also thought I knew a lot about double-blinded random controlled trials. But later on, I realized that I missed a couple of points. I thought that the efficacy would be shown by counting our antibodies three weeks after the second dose, and after that, it would be unblinded. Then we got the info that, no, we want to test it in real life, so the trial stays blind until a certain number get infected. Okay, that's understandable. But now, 10 months after the first dose, it is still blind. Where the rest of my friends and family have gotten real vaccines, officially, I still don't know what I got and if I'm protected. I also have no official proof of being vaccinated, uh, which makes life now difficult. So what I did last week is to quit the trial and I got my first Pfizer. And at the end of June, I'll get my second shot, which allows me to visit my home country and family for the first time in two years. My question for you is, mm. if trials are always blinded for a whole year, and if you think that this should be the same during a pandemic, I'm not sure if it's ethically fine that people who volunteered and only got the placebo are living for a whole year without any protection. By the way, I managed to find out, not officially, that I received the real shots last summer, so I will now be soon <laughs> four times vaccinated. Thanks a lot. Keep up the good work. Monica. So um, this one year sounds like an arbitrary number. I don't think that has anything to do with when a, a random co controlled trial would be unblinded. Mm -hmm. It would be after they reached a certain endpoint, a certain number of cases total um, between the placebo and the vaccine arm, for example, cases or severe cases or whatever. Um, and I know of at least one trial here in the United States where I knew somebody who was in the AstraZeneca trial. And when their turn came up to get the Pfizer vaccine, they went ahead and asked to be unblinded, just like you did. Um, and they, and then they went ahead and got their vaccine. So it seems like well, I, I'm not sure if you weren't able to find out if it was unblinded. You did find out evidently unofficially, but um, so uh, it, it's all dependent on the design of the trial and the endpoints as to, you know, when the people in the placebo arm would be offered the vaccine. And I think in the case of Moderna and Pfizer, um, the J&J &J vaccines, that once those results were publicized, my understanding is that the placebo arms were then offered the vaccine. Yeah, so I'm my my memory is a little bit hazy about this because it happened during the semester while I was teaching, and my <laughs> memory is hazy about a lot of things then. Um, but I know that um, when they were doing some of those trials, they they talked a little bit in one of the FDA meetings. Um, that you you could watch about what to do about this situation. And they sort of had the question of, do you leave the participants blinded? Do you unblind them? Um, or uh, do you um, unblind them and then vaccinate them? And there was a way to kind of do a different analysis in terms of um, the infections over time. Um, and this is where my memory is getting uh, fuzzy. Um, but I remember that there, it, from that, that there seemed to be a few different approaches to how you could deal with this problem that the company sort of had to choose um, when they were getting to this point. Right. And 
Monica points out that she was a trial volunteer for the Sinopharm, which is an inactivated virus vaccine. So not one of the ones that we're talking about trials that happened in the United States. So uh, it, it may have been different, but yeah. So sounds like you're going to have four vaccine shots. So should be well covered. I think, um, <clears throat> You know, it depends on how quickly they reach their milestones, right? And um, like the Novavax, you, as you see, the numbers are low compared to the total enrollment, but it, it took longer for them to, uh, to, to get to that number. Because remember, Matt Freeman was saying it should be done in May, <laughs> so which is only, I guess, last month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, depending the on how long it took to analyze the data, maybe it was done in May. Well, yeah, the Novavax said it was through April. The, the data that they talked about, I thought, was through April. Okay. So it took a while it to... It was in a time when there was there were, you know, fewer cases. So it's that problem that you have when there's yeah. less virus infection going on. It's going to take longer to get enough people yeah. infected yeah. to get to your endpoint. But if, I mean, all this is written in your agreement that you signed and they may have something like says, well, we may decide to extend it and you have to look at that. Um, you know, the 10 months, I mean, if they reach their endpoints, they should tell people, it seems to me. That especially, I think in a pandemic, you should do that, right? In a non-pandemic situation where it's not an emergency, you could take more time. But yeah, I think, you did the right thing to get yourself vaccinated. Right. So does so that implies that the Sinopharm is still, the, that clinical trial is still going on. It does, yeah. Yeah. Brienne? Yes. So Bob writes, looking at booster shots from another perspective, <laughs> if I am just over two weeks past my second Pfizer mRNA shot, I expect, I expect that my antibody count will be at a local high and that my T cells will be at the ready to defend me to the best of their ability. Should I actively seek close unmasked contact with a person who is in their SARS-CoV-2 contagious stage that has been infected with a quote unquote vaccine escape enabled variant? I'm thinking that the resulting boost that I receive will gain me improved protection against future variants. Bob, just a mechanical engineer on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. Um, <laughs> my feeling on this, Bob, is no. Um, you should not seek out infection. Um, while the vaccines are fabulous uh, and incredibly uh, impressive vaccines, um, they are not 100% <laughs> efficacious um, in protecting you from all disease. And I don't know that I'd want to risk it. I agree. I would not. I would not no. seek this out. No, don't do that. I think the data coming in on vaccines show that they work well against most of the variants. So I don't think you need to do this. Um, and anyway, where would you go? And, you know, you're in Canada. How do you know what's circulating? And where are you going to go to India to, to check out Delta? <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that you can, you know, go out and meet random people and sequence yeah. their virus yeah. and then decide so, with whom you should have close contact. <laughs> don't do that. Now, Lori writes, I listen to the TWIV periodically and have a COVID related question that I thought would be posed to your team, best posed to your team. Now that I'm fully vaccinated, is it safe to return to in-person worship at my church without a mask and without distancing? Seems that everyone has jumped on this bandwagon, but I wasn't sure if this was safe and I still have some reservations, but I'm eager to attend church in person once again. Any insights that you can provide would be most appreciated. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to give any, I, I wouldn't personally do it yet. I still am not going to restaurants yet because as, as Brian said, the vaccine isn't a hundred percent and, um, I think, I don't know. What do you think? What do you guys think? What should we tell Lori? Well, I'm looking up the <laughs> CDC recommendations for fully vaccinated adults. Yeah. And it says you can resume activities that you did prior to the pandemic without wearing a mask or physical distancing, except where required by federal, state, local, tribal, or territorial laws, rules, and regulations. Yeah, so I think that's what the CDC says. I think the one piece I would mention to Lori is 
for me, it is somewhat dependent on um, the virus levels in the area that I'm in and sort of the vaccine levels in the area that I'm in. Um, and so I would think about how much virus uh, is there in your community in making this decision. Right. And for instance, if you're in Vermont, where by midnight tonight, they're going to take off all restrictions because there's 80 percent vaccinated adult mm. uh, levels. Um, I I think it would be fine. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's a good point. So it, I agree with Brianne. It, it depends where you are. Um, I know some places are uh, doing outdoor church, especially now that it's summertime and it's something that you can do. Uh, what I haven't seen, and I wish somebody could um, goose the CDC to say, um, you know, give some kind of recommendation for singing outdoors, mm. distanced. Do people also need to be masked? Uh, but there's no advice on that. Right. People and, have been asking me for that. And, and I've been telling people that, you know, if wearing a mask makes you more comfortable, you should keep wearing the mask. Yeah. Um, there, there's no reason to, you have to stop wearing it. Um, and if you see someone wearing a mask, then who knows why they are and just go with it. You don't need to say something to them. You don't need to ask them what's going on. Um, there, there are a lot of days recently where I've been wearing my mask because the pollen count is high. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've noticed that it, I've anecdotally noticed that it helps and I am willing to, <laughs> Go with that. Yeah, well, you know, some churches may require masks still, right? Uh, there, it's up to them. I know a lot. The store I go to requires a mask. Here at Columbia, we need to wear a mask, except if you're alone in your office, which is what I am now. So it depends where you are. But if uh, as if the state is low, and uh, uh, yeah, I think that would be fine, Lori. But you could wear a mask too if you're worried. I mean, here on the street, I see a mix of people with and without masks. Same thing in New Jersey. It's a mix. Mm -hmm. Some people are not, and they're okay. Some people want to still wear masks. I think it's fine. Uh, let's do one more round. Um, Kathy. Sebastian writes, Hi, Twiv. Hello from Belgium, where the weather is an untypical but extremely pleasant 23 degrees Celsius and sunny. I became a regular listener of Twiv ever since COVID made me want to brush up on my virology. But recently, I find myself lucky, liking the non-COVID episodes more and more. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I just finished out episode 756 on the development of new polio vaccines and their test in the 68 containers, Poliopolis. I had the chance to listen to Hilde Revitz at the 2018 meeting of the Belgian Society of Microbiology and remembered a neat detail you didn't mention. Belgium switched from OPV to IPV, so oral polio vaccine to inactivated polio vaccine, only in 2000 and has a very high polio vaccine uptake, meaning that at the time of the trial, almost the entire adult population had some level of gut immunity. This is great for limiting the risk of circulating virus if some managed to escape poliopolis. That same factor, however, made Belgians unsuitable test subjects for the trial. Luckily, a large number of Dutch studies and work in Antwerpen and the Netherlands switched from OPV to IPV before we did in Belgium. By recruiting Dutch students in Belgium, they had both the benefit of running the trial in a community that has a great level of immunity, including gut immunity, and of having volunteers that had been vaccinated with IPV, the inactivated polio vaccine. The volunteers, however, had to agree to remain in Belgium for a certain time after the experiment because levels of vaccination in the so-called Dutch Bible Belt are quite low. Cheers, and please never stop your great work, especially the non-COVID episodes. Sebastian. And uh, then he has a PS. A few episodes back, you made a list of favorites among the older episodes. Would it be possible to have a list pinned somewhere on the website? Maybe I missed it, but it would be a great resource for new listeners. So I don't know, you'd have to talk to Vincent, the webmaster, to see if that could be done. <laughs> but I did go back and find out which episode it was. It was in the letters section of 762. And um, just for starters, some of the uh, centennial ones, 200, 400, and 500 were recommended. Uh, 68, Ode to a Plaque, Concerto and B, Fauci Pharmacy, and... Uh, 
West Nile virus number one, TWIV number one. And also that we pointed out that at the end of most years, we do a roundup of the f about 10 favorites for the year. So if you listen to the last one in December or the first one in January, that would give you highlights for that particular year. So, um, but that uh, story about Belgium, did you know about that, Vincent? I didn't. That's very cool. I like that. Um, it makes perfect sense, too. And I do know that they call it the Dutch Bible Belt. I've talked to many people at meetings about that. And that's, uh, if you remember the study we did some time ago where they showed that measles erases immune memory, right? They that used was on immune. kids in the, was it, that was in a, uh, was that on immune? Yeah. Yeah, immune 26. Uh yeah, we had Michael Minna on for that, didn't we? Yeah. 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 Yep. In fact, they used kids from the Dutch Bible Belt who weren't immunized to to do that. Cause, and I was talking to, I think it was Dirk Jakmans who writes often at a meeting in uh, Rotterdam. And he said, even though they don't immunize their kids, they're very willing to participate in clinical studies to help others. <laughs> so we can go. And he was telling me about the measles study then. So huh. that's a cool thing. I didn't know about that. That's a great uh, story. Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah, that's, that's very clever that someone worked that out. Yep. I've tried to keep the, the microbe.tv clean on the right side. So, you know, we have the posts and then there's a right column. And on the right column, you can put stuff. Right now, it just says contribute. And the reason is that if you look at it on a cell phone, whatever runs on the right column goes all the way to the bottom because it's too narrow on a cell phone. And so I figured nobody's going to see it. But I could put a link. If you go to the old site, twiv.tv, remember that? Twiv.tv. Mm -hmm. You will see on the right, uh, there is... <clears throat> well, I took it all down. Well, nothing's loading. Something's screwed up. There used to be all the old posts, and now it's just the top. Oh, boy. Anyway, I used to have stuff on the right. But I could do that. I could add one thing with... Cool episodes, cool past episodes, um, if you want. Uh, Brienne. Jennifer writes, Dearest TWIV team, thank you so very much for the fascinating conversations you freely post for us to listen to. I have learned an incredible amount from you all. Here is my question from a close friend. As you may be aware, Canada has had a different approach to SARS-CoV-2 vaccinations than the USA, entirely due to vaccine scarcity. This has put some people in interesting scenarios, one of which I would like to ask about. A 65-year-old took the first available vaccine, AstraZeneca, for their first dose. Dr. Daniel Griffin would be happy, LOL. Canada has approved mixing of manufacturers between the first and second doses. Pfizer has increased shipments to Canada and is the predominant vaccine currently available, early June 2021. Note, this person has a grandchild undergoing cancer treatment and so would like to make the best decision for the lowest possible breakthrough infection and or transmission. Question, should this person take the first available second dose regardless of manufacturer? Is there a possible advantage in getting the slightly more effective Pfizer vaccine for their second dose? I find it hard to answer this in the articles out there. Any thoughts? Many, many thanks, Jennifer, who is a specialist in dialysis and water treatment equipment management in lovely Victoria, BC. Um, so uh, I would say um, you want to get the first available dose. Uh, and there's been some data that's sort of been popping out in the past couple of days um, about heterologous uh, boosts as well, that uh, mixing may be beneficial. Um, and uh, Daniel also says to get the first available uh, second dose. Right. When I when I first read this question, I also was thinking about something else that Daniel said on TWIV 767, and he was talking about uh, people coming to the United States who are just partway through their uh, vaccine series for COVID, uh, and they've gotten um, their first dose elsewhere, um, and what should they get for their second dose? And if it's something on the WHO list, then getting a second dose of any of the three that are that have emergency use authorization uh, is fine. If their first dose was something that's not on the WHO list, 
then they should just start from scratch. Mm. Great. I think I captured that correctly from what he said. I was gardening when I was listening, so <laughs> paying attention. All right. As Kevin writes, hello, Vincent and Twiv team. This may sound like a strange question, but how good are you guys? Let me explain why I ask. My degree is in physics, far away from what you guys talk about, but I have always tried to have a scientific, logical, objective, evidential outlook on life, and it seems to me that is what you do as well. When discussing the pandemic with friends, I sometimes mention TWIV episodes, but sometimes get the reply, but who are those guys? It's only four people having a chat. Why should I believe them and not doctor slash prof insert name? Is there some international association of senior virologists that you are a part of? Is there another measure of credibility that I can point to when I mention you? Anyway, keep up the good work. I enjoy listening and watching, even if I don't understand what you are talking about half the time. Thanks, Kevin. Well, Kevin, <laughs> it's all about being experts. That's why we started to live. We're virologists. And, and Kathy compiled a little summary now, several of us have had long careers in virology. Kathy, 45 plus years. Me, 45 plus. Similar for Rich. That means researching, teaching, writing about viruses. 18 years of experience in academic uh, virology for Brianne, as well as having done and still doing research on viruses and immunology, having served as reviewers on NIH study section. And I and Rich were both chairs of virology study sections, editors and reviewers for virology journals, Vincent, Kathy, Rich, Briand, having served in offices at the American Society uh, for Virology. I have been counselor and president. Uh, Kathy and Rich have been program chair, and Kathy is currently secretary treasurer. Uh, Vincent, Rich, and Kathy are members of the American Academy of Microbiology. You can look that up. Alan got his PhD in virology in my lab. He subsequently trained and has uh, experience in science writing. And Dixon, of course, has a distinguished career in parasitology. You can find some of this at microbe.tv slash people. There's actually a website that's been up for years that describes everyone's uh, expertise. I happen to have a, a Wikipedia page and I was just looking at it, and it seems that someone has made a Wikipedia page for TWIV, which I didn't know about. And it's pretty cute. Um, it's funny. This Week in Virology, abbreviated as TWIV, pronounced phonetically. <laughs> uh, it, it says here that the podcast uh, gained a significant audience during the COVID pandemic. And... Um, there are frequent segments featuring frontline researchers, including director of the NIAID, Tony Fauci. <laughs> um, and then they have uh, some links below. And they say, during this time, due to the Trump administration's conflicting statements about the nature and severity of the pandemic, the podcast received criticism from some quarters for getting too involved in politics, to which the panelists replied they wouldn't get involved in politics if politics wouldn't get involved in science. Look, we got an article by William Joy. We got TWIV 645. We got a Columbia University article. We have uh, guests, a link to the guest page, which I haven't kept up. We have a link to Daniel Griffin. And a Dorchester Reporter article from Bill Walzak. The virology podcast TWIV has become an essential source for COVID-19 news. So thank you. That's pretty cool. I say length, 40 minutes to two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> they got everybody here. And Dixon also has a, a Wikipedia page as well. So anyway, that's uh, Kevin. You can find a lot of information on us. And you should listen to virologists when you have questions about virology, not some random person who says they're a doctor or a prof and you have no idea about them that you meet on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. If you can't validate them, I agree. It's hard to listen. So... There you go. We're validatable. <laughs> Did I miss anything? Is that good? That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Rich will be excited to know that there's the Twiv is in Wikipedia. It's kind of funny that he hadn't already found I it. I just found it today. Just looking now, I saw, I went to my page to make sure it was still there. And then I saw Twiv had a link. So I followed that. Um, 
Dixon, Very of course, has, has had more years than uh, than us in in parasitology. So, I mean, that was my in all the podcasts. It's, my goal is to get people who are experts in the field. So, and that's why people are, are turning to us, Kevin, for advice. But you know, the thing is that we've talked about this before. Sometimes people don't care about knowledge, right? They only care about what they hear and what they believe, you know, and so I don't care if you have 40 years of experience. That's just the way it is. What can you do? Time for some picks of the week. Brianne, what do you have for us? Uh, so my picks are some gifts that I recently bought for mm -hmm. uh, some friends, young children um, that we have really been enjoying uh, reading to the kids. Um, so there is a baby university series um, and I uh, gave uh, my friends' children uh, pandemics for babies, germ theory for babies, and vaccines for babies. Um, and um, my friends afterwards said, you know, I learned in a lot of things from that pandemics book. Um, <laughs> and so they're really cute. Uh, the kids seem to really like them, and they actually have some useful information. Uh, mm, so very cool. fun uh, for people to take a look at. That's a really cool. Thanks. That's great to know because you always need gifts. <laughs> At the, um, every time I come over, um, I have to read uh, Pandemics for Babies and Vaccines for Babies. Uh, the the two-year-old is uh, in pretty insistent on that. Cool. Nice. Very good. Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked a YouTube video that's mm -hmm. a minute and 30 seconds long called Playing with Time from Macro Room. And it's time-lapse photography. Of, oh, it's just so cool. And uh, it for me, auto-loaded to another one after that. And so I wrote in the show notes here, bet you can't watch just one. Um, and this was a, a suggestion from Isabel. So thanks, Isabel, for this. But check it out. They're amazing. Cool. Yeah. Uh, my pick is a New York Times article about Xi Zhongli. Uh, it's kind of an interview. A top virologist in China at center of a pandemic storm speaks out. So they spoke with her, I guess, by text mainly or email. Yeah, email. Um, and she basically says, you know, I this didn't come from my lab. We weren't working on it. How can I er offer evidence for something where there is no evidence? She said, her voice rising in anger during the brief conversation. I don't know what the world has come to, constantly pouring filth on an innocent scientist. So the thing is that I have always believed her. And um, it's just the, the subheading here, China's habitual secrecy makes her claims hard to validate. Why don't you just believe someone, folks? If she says with a lot of passion, it didn't come from me, why isn't the default to believe her? I give the default. And, you know, there's a picture of her in her lab. It looks totally like a Western BSL-4 lab, right? Spotless and organized. And she was trained in the West. She's a scientist. I believe her. In fact, as I mentioned before, I, I emailed her two weeks ago because I felt badly that all this shit was being dumped on her and... She responded really quickly. I figured she'd never respond. It would be censored or whatever. She responded, I'm so glad for your support. I really like what you're doing on TWIV. And it's too bad that um, people have to do this, you know. So I felt a lot of humanity there. And um, I think this is – and then Relman has to be goddamn quoted, uh, you know, saying we have to have transparent investigation. I don't know what his agenda is, Relman. He's, and this is a guy who was also a pain in the butt during the H5N1. And whenever there's some experiment he doesn't like, I, I sh and he was the driver behind the science letter. By the way, uh, Kathy, you might, might, I don't know if you were on when we read the letter from Pamela Bjorkman um, a couple of weeks ago or last week. Do you remember? Uh, I can't remember if I was on, but I certainly heard it. I'm she sorry. said, I'm sorry I signed it. It wasn't the intent that I meant. And I'm glad she had the courage to come out. It was, I don't think that's the right letter to sign because it is being investigated. Anyway, she, Zhongli, we're, we're behind you here on TWIV. And um, we have to find the source of this in nature. I think it's really important. And I, I, I what bugs me the most is some of my colleagues here think it came from her lab and I don't get it. 
and I've told them why it didn't and they don't believe me and I've been here for 40 years or whatever. And it just that just bothers me because you're not looking at science. And what's the main reason? Oh, is it the, the lab is right there where it started. Are you serious? Yeah. Seriously, folks. Yeah, I, I really, that one really frustrates me. Um, you know, the reason why the CDC is in Atlanta is that there was a lot of malaria in Atlanta. And so we built a lab there. And after SARS-1, they said, this seems like a place where there might be future outbreaks. Let's build a lab here. So if anything, it tells them they were right. <laughs> Anyway, this will sh be shown eventually to have come from somewhere in nature. We don't know where. And uh, that's the end of it, but it will take time. It will take 10 years for SARS-1, right, to figure it out. Yeah, and I'm sure Dr. Shi just wants to do her science. Yeah. Uh, and she, I, I read this this morning at home, and um, she does say something about, you know, some work that she wants to publish soon and so forth and all this other stuff can only be distracting and a, a time sink to have to, to deal with. I mean, with. can you imagine the pressure of thinking that the whole world thinks it came? I just can't imagine what she's going That's through. That's got to be so frustrating and so upsetting. It... And, you know, you know it didn't originate and you can't do anything about it. <laughs> uh, Bob Gallows quoted, She's a stellar scientist, extremely careful with a rigorous work ethic. Yeah, I'm glad that at least. Yeah. They, they said that about it. Anyway, anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's good to, to hear from her. All right, that's uh, TWIV769. The show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us your questions and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute, you know, just because you've got vaccinated doesn't mean you have to stop supporting us. It's not a lot of money, you know, it's like a cup of coffee a month and it really helps us a lot. Uh, so uh, we want to continue to provide um, science fact and a little bit of diversion here and there. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Brian Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>